Welcome to the Eat, Play, Love Fall Series. I'm Sandra Leah, Director of Education and Patient Advocacy at Obesity Matters. Meet my co-host, Rachel Atkins. Hi everyone, I'm Rachel, Director of Strategy with Obesity Matters. So excited to be here today. I know, it's been a minute, hasn't it? And I love the fall season, you know, that Christmas in the air, we get to put on sweaters and be cozy. Obesity Matters is a nonprofit organization for people living with elevated weight and obesity. It was formed by patient advocates whose focus is to provide evidence-based education and advocate for public policy and environmental changes that enable well-being. And if we can do that, um, we're one step closer to the acceptance and inclusion of millions of people in larger bodies. The Eat, Play, Love Fall series runs weekly interactive events with experts. The first half of the episode is the interview, and then we turn the spotlight on all of you, the audience, to address your questions and comments in a safe and supportive environment. This season, we really want to reflect on the last 18 months um, being in a pandemic and how things are now slowly opening up again, and we survived. Uh, and hopefully we thrived and we were able to transform to normalcy of our lives over the last few months. Because of that, we are more thankful and mindful than ever about our health and how far we have come in our own journey. So today we're testing something out. We wanna get more interactive with all of our audience members. So we have a poll for you today and Priti's going to put that poll up now. Oh, do we all get to do it? I get to do it too. Yeah, please. I get to do the fall. Woo! I never get to do the fall. <laughs> yeah, we want to hear. Oh, the poll is closed. So here we are. Do you feel that weight is something that can be treated? So 89% of you believe that that is true. And 7%, or sorry, 11% uh, believe that's false. So let's continue on and see where we go with this information. So today our special guest is Dr. Laura Reardon, who specializes in sustainable and restorative health and weight management programs at her clinic, Lotus Health in Halifax. I have always admired how Dr. Reardon is able to balance compassion and empathy for her patients living with obesity with strong science and research-based treatment options. She is joining us today for a discussion on um, whether the inner workings of our hormones and what they play in weight management. So Laura, we're thrilled to have you here with us. Please tell us a little bit about yourself and your areas of interest in obesity management. Thanks, Sandra. I'm so honored to be here and welcome to everybody. Um, I, uh, I, I'm not going to bore you too much with myself because I'm boring, but I will tell you that I'm very passionate about metabolic care for patients. And, and I think I, that was the best introduction, Sandra. Thank you. Sandra is a dear friend. So she always says nice things, but I, I really do appreciate that. Um, and they're all true. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I have a real passion for this. I used to do, uh, I used to be in family medicine and then uh, for many reasons, including, you know, my own journey with weight and prediabetes and prehypertension, uh, seeing my family living, uh, living with weight, uh, my patients, right, who are all like, I just don't understand this, this has got to be more complicated. And, and so through, through lots of kind of historical things, I won't bore you with, I ended up going back to residency and, and I ended up doing a bariatric fellowship. In, uh, through university in Chicago, and I did extra training in this, and, and that's what I do now. I, I see patients living with metabolic conditions, and I have the best little corner of medicine going. I, I always say at Lotus Health, we have this little corner of sunshine when there's a lot of very serious and heavy things going on in the world with this little corner of, of happiness and healthiness and uh, where patients are getting better. And, and uh, while we still have a long way to go with lots of things we're still learning and exploring, uh, we've come a long way. And, and so I get the, the, the joy of loving my work. And, and so we do, we do one year weight management programs at our clinic. Uh, that's the mainstay of what we do. And it's pretty great. So yeah, that's, that's my, uh, that's my practice. Yeah. It's obvious that you love what you do and you deep, you care deeply for your patients. 
I want to set the stage for our conversation today. Can you share an overview of the role of hormones in appetite, metabolism, and weight? Right. So I'm going to keep it kind of a big broad strokes because I think if we look at the way we've been looking, you know, if we look at for, for not just years, we're not just decades, generations, we've been looking at weight as a math problem, right? It's about calories in, calories out. If you're living with weight, it's because you, and a solution if you're living with weight is that you need to eat less and exercise more. And if that's not working for you, then you need to try harder. You need to find the perfect diet. You need to uh, exercise more. And if that doesn't work, oh, well, you're just not doing it enough. You're not applying enough character. You need more willpower. You need more effort. You are being lazy. You are being uh, greedy, you know, because it's just not working. And so that, 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 that oversimplification, of course, is wrong. And it's not the way weight works, as it turns out. And of course, this is, in my opinion, and the opinion of many people, uh, this is where the harm comes in, right? Because if you can't get this right, there's something wrong with you. And then, of course, patients look inward and they say, well, there must be something wrong with me. And this is, you know, a, a, a huge problem, right? I mean, I, we could talk about that for an hour. But, you know, so, so it, it, this is why so many patients don't seek help, why they are at home feeling frustrated it is because the simple math equation, not only is it wrong, but it harms people. And, and this is a huge issue. So what is weight? Well, weight is about chemistry. Our bodies do chemistry. And we were joking before that, you know, it, it's about chemistry and we've all got great chemistry. So this is going to go really, really well. And, and why this topic is so uh, important to me is that raging hormones is the chemistry. And so our bodies, how I like for people to think about weight is that weight is ultimately determined in your brain, just like your blood pressure, just like how much salt you carry around in your blood, like your, uh, your blood pressure, your heart rate, your body temperature, it's all regulated in your brain in this deep primitive dark place in your brain. And it's determined there in your brain by influenced by many dozens of hormones, many hundreds of chemical signals that act very much like this dynamic symphony of things. That, and by the way, it's not just static. You know, our bodies are not static. Here's our hormones and this is what it is, right? We all know our body. It's like this symphony that's playing all the time and, and, and we're being pushed towards weight gain, weight stability, weight loss, and all because of this hormone speaking to our brain, ultimately speaking to the brain, the brain speaking back to tell us what to do. And so it's, it's this, it's a uh, symphony of hormones and it's very easy. And I think it's always important to remember and reflect that weight, when you're living with weight, that's just a symptom, right? There can be many causes of that. So within that symphony of hormones, is it a problem in this hormone or that hormone? And is it a problem somewhere in the brain? And I think we were still learning about that in medicine. And I sat in a call the other day talking about the diversity of people living with weight. And I think we always need to remember that there can be many causes, right? It's not just one thing and this is the problem and there's one size fits all fix for that. And so it, it, in amongst this, this hormone or the raging sea of raging hormones, what is your, it, what is that patient sitting in front of you? What's the most likely cause? And I wish I could tell you that we had all the answers for this, that we know exactly all of this. We're it's still a work in progress. We've learned a lot. We've come a long way, um, but we still have more to learn in this area. And my hope is that someday we can, we can have a, a full diversity of ways to assess patients and treat patients that can be even better than what we have right now. Hopefully that answers the question or is it's a story. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's, it's really touched on the point that, um, our hormones create this chemistry. We do have great chemistry, but you know, there obviously are points in our life where perhaps our hormones are a little more out of balance than others. So if you can touch on that, uh, and let us know what are those stages, uh, for most of us and, um, maybe then what that means to your hormones, why are they potentially causing you to have excess weight? Yeah, great question, Rachel. I love it. the The questions for this thing is are just so good. So the um, so let's go back to that symphony. Okay, so you have this symphony playing. Um, what 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 is influencing that, and what can take that uh, out of whack? And of course, there are infinite ways that that symphony can be taken out of whack. But what are the classic things? So there are patients that can be born, right? There are genetic predispositions. There might be something in your genes that can put you at risk for this right from the start before you're even born. Uh, maybe uh, in the environment of your in utero space can influence that. 
Um, so we know that there's a genetic platform that we're all working with. We also know that there are particularly vulnerable stages. So there can be changes in the food supply, changes in movement, injuries, illnesses, um, stresses, uh, changes in medications, um, and, and in particular changes in hormones in, in stages of life. So think about birth, think about uh, puberty, think about um, pregnancy, menopause, manopause uh, for some of the guys out there. Uh, it's not just women that get raging hormones, men can have raging hormones too. And uh, so, so these can be, and I think uh, that's a really fascinating uh, topic too, is the difference between men and women and their hormones and their weight loss, because they can have, or there tend to be signals for differences between men and women. But uh, these are the stages where we can be particularly vulnerable. And, uh, you know, so, you know, pregnancy is particularly fascinating because, of course, pregnancy is a moment where the hormone in particular, the hormone insulin rises very, very high. And it's raised high to be able to protect that, protect you and protect the baby from potentially starving to death. The problem is if you get stuck in that hormonal situation, you can then, uh, you know, it, it may, it, it can be sometimes the trigger for weight gain for a lot of women, not everyone, but it can be a classic trigger for, for living with weight down the road, either right after pregnancy or, or many years later. So that, that can be a trigger for that. And, you know, there's some women that can have a pregnancy and they seem to lose the weight, you know, you're like, you lose the weight six weeks later. And then there's women who, who really, uh, it, it can have a great difficulty losing weight after pregnancy. And it's because of that hormonal state that's very normal in pregnancy, but doesn't completely come off after you've had the baby. For some people, that can be the case, or maybe it's the third baby, uh, or maybe it's not even until menopause. So these things tend to interact, these stages of life or uh, these influences on that that symphony can be uh, cumulative, right? So it's like, you know, I had the stress of, or maybe you know, I had an, an issue in puberty or maybe, and then I started university and my dietary environment changed. And then I uh, had a stressful job or then I had a divorce or I was put on a medication. And, and these things can, they're not just in isolation, right? Patients are never in isolation. It's always a cumulative or it can be a cumulative effect over time. And then, you know, menopause hits and boom, right? That's the camel or the straw that broke the camel's back proverbially. So, you know, it, 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 it tend, it can be one dramatic event like COVID, you know, a uh, dramatic event like COVID. And what, what I try to, to, to say to people, and if I can say one thing on this, I, I always say, you know, people, some people, not everybody, but there are many people who added extra weight during, during COVID. And a lot of people blamed it on, oh, well, everybody got home and they didn't exercise anymore and they're eating so much more. Um, and, and I often say, look, let's bring this back away from this topic of eat less, exercise more and start talking about the hormones of this, right? COVID, international global pandemic, all right? If you don't think, there have been many global pandemics in our civilization, in our history, probably millions of years of pandemics, right? As long as there's been primates, there's been pandemics. And COVID is probably the first global pandemic that has ever happened that wasn't associated with a global mass famine. And if you don't think that your brain, your ancient primitive brain, doesn't have some protection mechanism in there, right, that, that changes your behaviors to keep you from starving to death, right? So COVID, stress, pandemic, the world changing, like this was a big deal. And you might not have felt it was a big deal. You might not have, you know, thought, oh, this is so stressful. I, I, I need to protect myself against starvation, but your brain knows. And there's a reason why in March of 2020, was it 2020? Everybody went out and grabbed every toilet roll they could find, right? It was weird. It was, didn't make sense. That is the primitive brain behaviors coming out of what is, is sort of an awkward modern way of saying, ah, you know, we're all at risk. We're going to do that. So don't forget that, you know, this wasn't about all oh, everybody's eating pies and not exercising anymore. This is about chemistry, right? If you had weight gain and COVID, during COVID, uh, you have to really consider that there's a hormonal stress reaction to that as well. So I digress a little bit there. I wasn't planning to say that, but there we are. <laughs>
No, that's really helpful. And it makes me think of, you know, even in the beginning in those mornings when I would allow myself to watch the news every morning and think, oh, well, it's not really impacting me. But then I had to stop because even just listening to a few minutes of the news in the morning about the pandemic, I think was making a difference to the rest of my day. Um, you know, you touched on some really good examples for women and periods in our life where our hormones might not be balanced well. Um, you know, aside from the COVID example that you just gave, are there other stages that are pretty natural for men to kind of experience that hormonal hormonal imbalance as well and what does that look like for them versus yeah, what it would look like for women yeah that's a great so there's two things on this that i'll mention quickly uh so you know men don't have the classic stages perhaps that women might have but they don't have pregnancies they 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 don't have menopause in the classic example, although men can have a decrease in testosterone over time at around the same age. Uh, the interesting thing in men is puberty can sometimes be an interesting weight gain. And when I did my bariatric fellowship, they talked a lot about how um, it's natural to have kind of a physiologic insulin resistance that develops during puberty in men, in women too, but in particularly with men. And so you'll see uh, one of my bariatric colleagues used to say, you know, you'll see sometimes like 12 to 14 year old um, young men who will, you know, gain weight and, 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 and you have to be careful. You don't diagnose them with obesity because they're, what they're doing is they get this physiologic insulin resistance pre pre puberty. Um, they'll gain a lot more fat and, and, and they're holding on to extra fat. And then the testosterone kicks in and they just launch up in size. So that's physiologic, meaning that's normal for that to happen. Some kids, it can become pathologic. So you have to watch that it, it doesn't, that, that weight gain, you know, and this is a big thing that we have to do in pediatric um, bariatrics is that we don't have to, you know, we don't want to mistake what's physiologic normal weight loss at an age group and to say, you just have to monitor it and what can lead to then uh, more of a weight loss that could be troublesome for that patient. So I think, you know, I think it's important to realize that there are normal times when the hormones can go to the whack and then that there's an abnormal time as well. So that's the one that's the, the two things that stick out for men but I will say this the difference between men and women and, and Sandra and I spent some lovely times together in Nashville Tennessee at what we call a great conference called obesity week and one of the talks I went to that was wonderful and it was called uh, the wonder woman effect and and it was something they didn't talk a little bit about it, but afterwards I researched more on it and it's something we see often in clinic is how do men lose weight and how do women lose weight and and I do want to point out that everybody loses weight and has weight, you know, it, it's a great diversity across the board. So I don't like to make huge, like men, this always happens and women, this always happens and every, you know, it's, it's a trend, right? And, and I think it's an interesting trend that we see between men and women uh, that, uh, you know, when you get men healthier, so if you, if, if a man joins our weight, uh, weight or metabolic program and we get him healthier, what happens very predictably is his testosterone rises and his estrogen decreases. So what you see is this uh, testosterone rising, they tend to feel better, increased energy, they lose fat like crazy a lot of the time, okay? So they lose weight very, very quickly. Um, they feel great, they get a surge of, and they gain muscle and they start to, their shape changes, right? Their shoulders get broader, their waist gets narrower, and you can see this effect of this testosterone. And then they tend to kind of plateau into like a nice steady weight loss. Women, it's very different. This is the one woman effect. So you get this uh, interesting phenomenon where as you get women healthier, the exact opposite happens. Estrogen rises and testosterone decreases. And by the way, for all of you out there, this also leads to increased fertility. So it's one of the mechanisms we use to improve fertility and fertility outcomes in women. I have a little corner of medicine here in my clinic where we see women uh, who, are, who are really trying to get, having difficulty becoming pregnant. We help them with that. Because if you've ever had heard of PCOS, PCOS is the reverse. A woman with too much testosterone, too little estrogen. I mean, that's a bit oversimplified. And then through what we do, we can reverse that. And that gets them healthier. It gives them weight loss and it gives them increased fertility. The problem is with that, in many cases, we can see a different weight loss curve. So they can actually have some weight plateau for a period of time because increased estrogen means holding on to a little bit of fat, right? So you can see redistribution of fat. You can see fat uh, changing places. So sometimes you'll see a waist circumference change in a woman, but their weight won't come down. And they're like, ah, Dr. Laura, why is my weight coming down? <laughs> and we'll have this conversation and we'll talk about, you know, measuring success beyond the scale, of course, which is a wonderful uh, topic we could talk about. But uh, I, I think we're, we talk, we focus on improved health and we talk about um, 
waist circumference and fat redistribution. And then we say, look, you'll probably what you're going to see is that down the road, you're going to lose weight. And so practically what we see and sort of the cliche we're, we're looking, we, we, way of looking at this is you always hear from people, you know, uh, you have a husband and wife, for instance, who come and they come together and, you know, the, 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 the husband and wife will join the program together. And the husband has lost 30 pounds in three months. And the wife has lost three pounds and, and she's been perfect, quotes perfect, which is not something we try forever, but that's what they will describe. And, and, and she's lost 10 pounds and he's lost 30 pounds and not happy, right? And, and, and all he did was give up, you know, not have a pop. <laughs> And she's been really, really careful. And so we have to have that conversation. So again, that's a general trend. It's not, it isn't, you know, it's not like this, everybody is always a little bit different, but it's a trend that I think is really interesting. And I share with you today. Yeah, I find that. So I feel like I've dated those guys who are, you know, will say, I'm not going to eat Doritos before bed anymore. And then they're like, they drop 10 pounds. <laughs> and I'm like, Doritos before bed. I can't. So I want to pick up on the fat distribution. So if, you know, I'm perimenopausal, as probably lots of women on this call are, and I've noticed that, you know, the smallest part of my body was always my waist. And now I have like some accumulation around my waist. I'm like, where did that come from? And so I have a two part question for you, mm -hmm. depending on the cause of the hormonal imbalance. What can we adjust in our eating behaviors environment to manage this um, weight fluctuation? Mm -hmm. okay. And also so, the second part, are there things we just have to accept because of our genetics? Okay, that's a lot of questions. I know, <laughs> I, I'm not a fan of two part questions. So let's just do the first one. Is there anything I can manage about okay. this new thing that's happening so, around my waist? I mean, basically Sandra's like, Laura, can you tell me everything you know about treating weight? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, we got like eight minutes left. So go tell me everything it. you know in eight minutes. So, okay, let's talk about what we can talk about here. So um, what you're saying is, so there's, a, there, there are, so there are many ways people hold on to weight. And, and, and again, all reflecting that symphony of what hormone is going wrong. So there's people with lipid storage disorders and things like that, that, that they can display different fat distributions in different areas. And there's a component of uh, environment and genetics to that. Okay, so if your mom held weight here, you may hold weight there too. Um, and, and so there's a genetic component, obviously, to that. There's also an environmental component, which also combines with the genetics too, right? So it's like, when I, okay, I'm talking about myself here. So I'm not don't anybody get mad at me, but when I eat donuts, I gain weight in the same place as my mom. <laughs> <So> <laughs> there's that environmental and, and, and uh, in, environmental and genetic component. So there, definitely you can store weight in different places based on genetics, based on environment. Um, and, and it just reflects the diversity of how, uh, uh, of what issues with weight there can be. Now, I will point out one really common thing is that when people have a metabolic syndrome, uh, which is we describe as an insulin resistance syndrome or hyperinsulinemia, uh, the very notorious place that people will store weight then in that circumstance is around the belly and around the, the liver. So abdominal obesity. And which is also tends to be the more sinister form of obesity, uh, as it turns out, women, you know, the weight that's around the waist and the hips and the legs tends to be less associated with uh, poor outcomes than that abdominal, that waist circumference uh, obesity. And it's because of why it's being stored there. And, and this, this high insulin or metabolic syndrome uh, can drive things like diabetes and uh, heart disease, stroke, hypertension, dyslipidemia, blah, 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 fatty liver. So, it, you know, and this comes from basically the hormone insulin saying to your body, and by the way, if we really want to get in the science of this, insulin goes up because uh, it's an anti-starvation hormone. It, it, it thinks, your brain is thinking, hmm, I think there could be some risk of starvation here. We better raise this hormone. Uh, and it's often inappropriate because the actual risk of starvation in our modern world is probably close to nothing, but our, mod our old ancient brain is hardwired to think always that any threat to the body could potentially be starvation. So it's very easy to sort of tripwire this anti-starvation cascade of hormones that can, you know, say, hey, you know, Laura, you could be starving to death. We better put this hormonal cascade and, and this high insulin state tends to do that. And what it does is it push tends to push the food you eat into your belly, um, what I sometimes call the fat fanny pack. Um, <laughs> 
it's and, and, and the reason why I call it that I, it's not judgment it truly is think about what would be great it, you know if you're at risk of starvation what's better than to have a little storage pack of extra weight for a rainy day right you store it there you pack it in and insulin pushes pre preferentially pushes the food you eat into the fat cells around your belly and then locks it there it's like a one-way valve we're all about to go into this election you know it's like you write the ballot and you put the ballot into the ballot box and it's a one-way valve it goes in but it's not coming back out again insulin makes fat go in and it doesn't let it come back out again. What a so great analogy. It, it's uh, you can eat less and exercise all day long, but if that fanny pack is locked up, yeah, that, that's not the solutions. We have to get the, the fanny only, the only reason I laughed about the fanny uh, fat pack is because I, I was trying to buy a Prada fanny pack and I'm like, it's not like that, right? It's not like a, a Prada one. <laughs> it's a little bit different. Rachel, over to you. I wish it was a Prada fanny pack. Um, <laughs> but, I, but I do, so I, I do want to say one quick thing because yeah. really what it is, the overarching thing around treatment for this. So, you know, whether it's one hormone or another hormone, we have this overarching kind of, uh, what are the strategies for getting people better? And they are always, I always talk about sort of the three-legged stool of treatment, which is there's the lifestyle strategies, the, you know, cleaning up your, you know, cleaning up the food environment. Where does movement fit into this? Uh, you know, learning to eat intuitively. What's the difference between hunger and cravings? Uh, what and when to eat? And then that, that's sort of the lifestyle stuff. Everyone, we're familiar with that. Then there's the second pillar, which is the you know behavior psychological pillar, the understanding that things like stress and sleep and emotional eating and injury and illness and all of those things also affect your body chemistry. And we have to have counseling around that. It's not just about food, right? And, and so there's so many, much of that that we have to do counseling around to get people better and stay better, or not stay better, but you know it's a chronic disease, but to help people maintain that over time and deal with it over time. Third pillar, medication and bariatric surgery. So, you know, we have lots of these strategies that we can use um, to, to get people better. And it's always different for everybody, but those are the general tenets. So when you ask about treatment, that's basically all I know about obesity medicine, those three, <laughs> those three pillars and everything that goes in them. <laughs> Sorry, Rachel. What shoot? Next question. No, that's great. Thanks for adding that. Um, you know, I You've touched on this point a couple of times, right? This whole concept of, you know, all you have to do is eat less and move more. You know, I think it's all part of that damaging diet culture that we live in right now. So do you have any other advice um, to share with us to help us, you know, when we're thinking about managing our weight, um, managing it within this really damaging diet culture, what does that look like? Man, oh man, Rachel, that's like, how do you impact that really? Because it's, it is, you know, you've got, when I'm seeing patients one-on-one, -on -one, uh, you know, we can, we have our little bubble and we've been really lucky in COVID, right? Because we've had these little bubbles where we can kind of protect ourselves and our patients. But now we're seeing this more and more, right? As people are expanding their horizons a little more, we're going back to work, we're seeing people, you know, it, it can be really challenging. And, and I'll tell you, the greatest challenges we have in our clinic are you know, you know, we assess patients, we figure out what's going on, we start a treatment protocol, we, you know, assess their response to treatment and make adjustments and, and patients do well, right? I mean, we tend to get good success, but the greatest obstacles, the most difficult things is where that treatment bubble of, of that sort of plan that we've created as a team to get our, uh, our patients better meets the real world. And they, there are so many obstacles. I mean, we could talk about um, inappropriate cultural norms, like, you know, weight isn't a disease. It's, you know, someone did it to themselves, right? Which I think is just, uh, I think one of the most damaging kind of cultural uh, things that, that tends to be, I and mean, not everybody feels that way, but it tends to be what our culture thinks about weight, a great challenge to overcome. Um, you, you think about, um, uh, food supply, right? Uh, we have a pathologic food supply. And, you know, people talk a lot about big pharma being, you know, a, a, an issue. Big pharma, like nothing in comparison. I mean, you could combine the big pharma and great tobacco together and they don't have the sinisterness of food companies. Mm -hmm. Sorry, if any food companies are, they'll probably be blacklisted from food companies from now on by saying this publicly, but man, oh man, they have strategies to make you think that you're eating something healthy when, yeah, far from. So uh, it's it, it can be very complex because not only are patients trying to figure out themselves and their body and their psychology, their physiology, all of this stuff, but they're trying to figure it out in this landscape that's kind of working against them. And so whether it's, 
you know, the food landscape, the cultural landscape, uh, what you're seeing, what you're promoted, of, you know, what is beautiful, what is healthy, uh, you know, is, and we live in a world where, you know, um, you know, we, we disregard the opinions of experts a lot of time, and we listen more to people like Kim Kardashian for advice on health. And, you know, I'm going to get blast listed by Kim Kardashian now too. <laughs> big trouble. But I think, you know, there's so many variables to that. And I think uh, my advice to people out there is two things. One, find a healthcare expert. Um, and whether that's any of the people on here today or someone in your own community, uh, find someone who is uh, enlightened with regard to weight, sees it as a chronic medical condition, uh, that they understand that and, and can have a conversation with you about it. Find other patients, find other people that um, you know ha have been through something like this and, and they can support you and help you on your journey. Uh, I, I don't like the word journey, but can help you with um, this, find trusted resources and stick to that because it's so easy, you know, it, 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 it's so easy to get distracted. There's so many distracting arguments out there. There's so much conflicting and it, it's a difficult, I find it difficult. I've been doing this for 16 years and I do it every day and it's challenging to navigate this space. And so find, uh, you know, whether it's a doctor or a nurse practitioner or uh, a, a coach like uh, Sandra, Find someone who sees, you know, obesity in a mod or weight as a, in a modern way, right? That's a chronic, complex chronic disease and, and seek out that help. Yeah. And I, I mean, Laura, you perfectly articulated one of the reasons why we created Obesity Matters, because it is so difficult for our community to navigate all the information out there and understand what will be helpful to them. So our final question that we ask all of our guests is what support can Obesity Matters offer to help our community? What advice can you offer us in terms of uh, how we can support help? Oh, I, I don't want to interrupt you. It's, can you hear me? It's me, sorry. Yeah, oh, yeah, somebody sorry. was I think talking? I, might be, I don't know, my internet connection kind of blipped there for a second. I don't know. Can you hear me? Can you hear me yes. now? Yes, we can hear you. Can you hear me? Laura? Oh, maybe we've, Laura's, is it, okay. I can't tell. Pretty, uh, is my internet okay? Is it me or is it Laura? Can I can hear you. Up? So thank you for that question. Actually, might be me. Can you hear me? Can someone confirm I can that hear they can you. Hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes, we can hear okay. So I'm trying to interrupt Sandra and there was a little bit there. I apologize. Um, I'll tell you what uh, communities uh, like Obesity Matters has been, you know, um, really helpful for is helping connect patients to people who are passionate and knowledgeable about weight um, and can direct them to the right resources. So some of the, uh, the, the things that have been most helpful uh, for, for, for that I can see from my patients and our clinic's perspective um, is creating a database of resources who you can go to. So I don't know, are you guys planning to do that? Maybe you've already done it yeah. and I don't know. Yeah. Oh, we're planning. Certainly it's in our, uh, you know, in our idea bank and, and we're hoping to execute. Yeah, so that central kind of national resource of trusted people that you can turn to. Um, and it doesn't have to be a doctor. Uh, it, it can be anybody who sees, it can be a patient advocate, it can be a healthcare professional, it can be somebody who can, you can reach out to that you can trust, um, that, that, that is uh, yeah, a trusted resource. So that, that's something I think would be helpful um, it, it, specifically for, for you guys. Um, I think that we are getting better. I think we, we still, we tend to get focused on the things that we still have left to do. And there still are lots of things we need to learn and do for patients um, across the country. What I will say is I feel really hopeful. I think we have, we're really making a difference. I've been doing this for a lot of years and things are getting better, right? There is more awareness. Uh, there is more, I mean, listen, there's still lots of not awareness too, and we could talk about that all day, but you know, I, I'm really hopeful that in the coming years, we're going to see big changes. We're going to see better access to care. We're going to see better access to treatment modalities. And, uh, you know, hopefully that's coming and hopefully you guys will be rated right on that wave supporting patients with that. 
Okay, great. So I know everybody is very eager to ask questions. So the floor is now open for audience questions. So we will alternate between live questions and the ones in the chat box in order of re uh, relevance. So we encourage you, if you're going to ask your question live, to turn on your camera uh, when you're ready to, and introduce yourself and just let us know where you're tuning in from. You can raise your hand virtually using the Zoom feature. Um, and off we go. I'm going to, let's see, has anybody? Someone, I have to say, someone said the first pandemic with raging social media. That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> so true. So true. Raging social media. It's, I mean, gosh. Yeah. yeah. Welcome, so Rosie. why don't we why don't we start with the chat box, Rosie? Do you have any questions from the chat box? Thank you so much. Yes, um, the the chat box is buzzing, and the the first question that we received early on um, in the the presentation today was a question from Laura D about what about patients who have had a whole thyroidectomy due to cancer? How does how do hormones relate to that? Yeah, so thyroid, um, you know, I think there's been a, uh, a lot of, I think a lot of people, very rightly so, suspect that when they uh, might be um, having difficulty managing their weight, that this is the thyroid, right? Oh, I know I've got a thyroid problem. We see that all the time. And I think people are under the kind of impression that thyroid is a kind of metabolic hormone that like, if you have enough, you rev your metabolism. If you don't have enough, it slows your metabolism. It's way more complicated than that. So thyroid, like if you take a bunch of thyroid medication, it doesn't make you lose weight. Um, it, it's not a weight loss hormone per se. Now, uh, what I would say is that if, you, if you've had a thyroidectomy, uh, there's two relevant things. One, I think it, whether you're getting your, it's important that you have just the right amount of thyroid hormone and whether you're making it yourself through your own thyroid or you're taking it through Synthroid, it is important to make sure that that dose is optimized uh, for best function of your body. I, I, and and, and I, I would say to some degree weight, but not as much as you think it would be. The, uh, what is important to remember is that Synthroid is a weight-based hormone. So what we see a lot of, like three times a day, is as patients get healthier and as they lose weight, um, they might need their Synthroid dose adjusted down. They don't need as much of it when they lose weight. And then if their weight goes up, they might need more of the hormone. So uh, thyroid is a part of that symphony. It's less a part of the weight symphony as sort of culturally we think of. Um, but it is important for optimal health to have that thyroid optimized. So as long as your TSH, the, the optimal range for the TSH, which is the hormone we use to measure whether your thyroid is in the optimal range should be ideally between 0.5 and 2.5. Uh, that's where patients feel the best. Um, so if you're in that range, then you should be good to go. Um, and so if you've had a thyroidectomy, then, you know, obviously that can be more challenging, especially if you are losing and gaining weight, you have to make sure that that's consistently being uh, screened for. The other thing that's relevant to having a history of thyroid cancer is that some of the medications we use to support weight loss, one of the tools we use, um, it, it can be used to help manage weight. Um, you can't use if you've had a history of medullary thyroid cancer. So I just bring that up because it is relevant to that history. Um, so I just go to that because my, uh, you know, my medical brain is going, doo -doo 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 -doo. that's relevant to you. You need to know that information. Uh, so if you have this type of what we call medullary thyroid cancer, uh, one of the medications we use typically for weight loss would not be an option, um, but there are other medications that would be an option for you. Thank you, Laura. Uh, back to you, Rosie, for a uh, chat box question. Okay, great. Thank you so much. So you mentioned um, the, the comments about raging social media. Uh, there was also a question around what, how would you define raging hormones? So, I mean, we use the term raging hormones because it's fun and it is, uh, I, I wouldn't say that necessarily in, in a metabolic disorder um, that, that hormones are necessarily raging. What they are is influencing your metabolism and body and how your body functions. And, but I think it's also important to remember that changes in body chemistry also affect how you think and how you behave. And I, I think we neglect that sometimes, you know, I, I, I sometimes sum it up in kind of the funny kind of flip com, uh, comment. Um, and again, oversimplification, but sometimes I say, look, the hormones made you do it. 
And, you know, because I think a lot of people tend to blame themselves like, oh, I, you know, I know I'm not supposed to eat donuts, but I still eat them anyway. And I say, look, like it's the hormones, the hormones make you do it. And, you know, again, an oversimplification, but I think it's really important to remember is that when that symphony is unbalanced and we are sort of calling that raging, but it's, you know, if it's unbalanced, that is also sending a signal to your brain and how your brain thinks. It's sending signals to your brain to change your behavior. And so instead of saying to yourself, I wish I had more willpower, I wish I had more accountability, I wish I had a better diet or a better exercise so that I could not eat donuts, um, I think it's important to reflect on like what, you know, that there might be a physiologic or a hormonal drive that, that you might not even be aware of, right? These things are very primitive under the scenes kind of stuff that may be driving your thought processes, your wants, your needs, your emotions, your behaviors, right? So I think um, it, 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 you can't look at the behaviors and it, we're, not in, we're not in control of our behaviors like we think we are. That's raging hormones. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad to hear that because that's going to be my new reason. I'm, it's not my fault. It's my hormones right now. <laughs> the hormone monster. The hormone monster made me do it. Hormone monster has taken over. Um, I think the, my hormone monster sometimes takes over when I'm driving too. <laughs> um, so I just want to remind everybody, if you want to ask a question live, you can raise your hand virtually within Zoom. If you're struggling with that, you can put in the chat box, I have a live question and we'll see your name and call on you. But uh, back to you, Rosie, any more uh, questions? Yes, thank you. Uh, there's a few questions coming in around pharmaceutical interventions that would be available to um, manage uh, hormones, maybe keep them in line, uh, as well as um, how they relate to being resistant to mindfulness practices. So the first mm -hmm. question is around pharmaceutical mm -hmm. interventions and then how to have a more mindful uh, okay. existence uh, with, your homo with your hormones. Okay, yeah, great question. Okay, so let's start with number one, pharmaceutical interventions. So what we're talking about here is what I talked about before, like the three pillars, lifestyle, psychological, and medication slash bariatric surgery. So let's talk about the medication. And the really exciting thing is that uh, we now have safe and effective medications for weight loss. Uh, they're prescribed by your healthcare provider. They're often paid for by your drug plan. Uh, and and they, these are not sold or basements. These are, you know, well-studied medications that are, uh, you know, very important and can be life-changing supports. Uh, medication alone is not a solution, but they can be incredible tool tools and as I say life-changing tools so so in that medication pillar what are the choices so we have three Health Canada approved medications uh, for weight loss um, we the two that we use most often uh, really work at the hormonal level at the, the, the body chemistry and the brain level and those two uh, there's one uh, called Sexenda which uh, it's that's its brand name. The the generic the generic name is liraglutide. It's a hormonal injection of the hormone GLP-1, which is one of the hormones that can become uh, dysregulated um, with weight gain and diabetes and other metabolic conditions. And when we replace that hormone, people get better and they get healthier across the board. Really, uh, what we see with GLP replacement, right? This is really hormone replacement. It's not the hormones you're used to thinking of like testosterone and estrogen and progesterone uh, and thyroid. This is a different hormone, GLP-1. And we replace that. People get healthier, right? They feel better. Their cognitive behavior, their cognitive functioning improves. They're less likely to have a heart attack or stroke. Blood pressure gets better. Inflammation decreases. Blood sugars come down. Weight comes down. Vitamin D deficiency corrects. Fatty liver disease corrects. You know, it, it, these really promote and signal for improved health and, and can be really life-changing. They can have some side effects um, to start. So it's important that you have have it prescribed by someone who's familiar with these medications and can help you with that. They can be a little tricky to start um, and to make sure you're a candidate for these and that your healthcare provider really knows how these work um, because it's not just about here, take this medication and come back in six months. Uh, you know, in most cases that can be quite disappointing. Um, so, you know, you want someone who actually understands what is happening, how to use that and, and, and how to mitigate any challenges or obstacles in the beginning. Once you're up and rolling, they, they are quite simple medications and they can be prescribed by anyone, but in the early days, they can be challenging. Um, that, that patient can be challenging. Uh, so that's liraglutide or Sixenda. Um, the other common one we use is something called Contrave. 
Um, and it's a newer medication. It's a pill form as opposed to an injection. And it is a combination of two medications we've had around since the 1940s, um, bupropion or Welbutrin, combined with naltrexone, which is an anti-addiction medication. And, and this medication is, is really great because it um, uh, is, is um, uh, we know how it works really, really well. It, it helps uh, at the hypothalamus level, at that level of the brain that helps kind of promote a, a sort of a, a weight loss. Uh, it helps with cravings. So when patients have um, emotional eating or cravings um, or, or kind of a, um, yeah, using food um, to, to feel better and manage emotions that contrave can sometimes help with that. And uh, it, it also helps actually with more mindfulness and more mindful eating. So that's interesting that you brought that up because it actually improves what we call executive functioning. So it, it, it creates the connection between uh, want and thought together. So you, you kind of, it creates uh, a little bit better connection between the brain, part of your brain that plans things and the part of the brain that does things. So it's a bit of an oversimplification, but it, it does promote better executive functioning, which is actually the ability to be able to say no. It, it helps improve restraint and, and more mindful eating practices. So those are the two that we most commonly use uh, in weight loss these days. Hopefully there's more to come. And I think there are more to come down the road and, and we'll keep our ears open for that. Um, they're great medications now along with the mindfulness. So I think it, it, mindfulness is a big topic right? And uh, mindfulness it sort of encompasses a lot of physiology, a lot of brain chemistry, and a lot of psychology, how you're thinking. I think what I would like to mention is that I think it's important to consider and recognize that eating behavior for most of us is all like what we call an observed subconscious activity. And what I mean by that is like, when you wake up in the morning and you brush your teeth, you're not really thinking about that. You're not like, I'm gonna brush to the left and brush to the right. And do, 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 do. You just do it. It's like a program that's running. You're aware of it. I'm brushing my teeth right now, but it's actually like a program that's, it's like autopilot, right? We use the word autopilot. It's an autopilot activity. And so it's much like driving to the grocery store you always go to or driving home from work or brushing your teeth or getting dressed. You actually didn't really think about that. You're aware that you did it, but you aren't really making those decisions to do that. It's, it's a program, an automatic program that's running. A lot of eating behavior is the same. It's this observed subconscious activity. Um, and so when we do that, we tend to, you know, it's the primitive, dark, you know, deeper parts of our brain that are making choices, right? I mean, how many of you have sat there and just mindlessly ate potato chips or popcorn? You're not even hungry. In fact, you're not even craving. You're not even hungry. You're just doing it because it's there, right? And, and, and I think, you know, or we come home from work and we are stressed and we're thinking we just start grabbing stuff out of the fridge and you're like, oh my gosh, I can't even, what did I just eat? I don't even remember eating it, right? That's that aspect of kind of, kind of mindlessness or just, you know, that it's an automatic pilot way of eating. So in our clinic, we talk a lot about how do we change, um, um, how do we change eating behavior from being a subconscious observed activity into something that is a conscious activity? How do we plan for that? And we activate, when you activate that, um, that planning part of your brain and you make it more of a conscious activity, uh, then you all of a sudden start igniting things like, huh, I wonder what groceries I need. I wonder what I'm going to make, what recipes I need. When am I going to go to the grocery store? What am I going to eat? And so it activates that part of the brain that, that is involved in planning and makes it more of a conscious activity. Uh, and I'll tell you the great thing that does that. And one of the great tools that's been around for feels like a million years, but a lot of years that has a lot of evidence behind it is writing things down. Now, a lot of people are, can be triggered by writing things down because we've all been at Weight Watchers a million times and the points and the writing and stuff. So, you know, some people don't love that, but it is a tool that can be really helpful for people to journal, to write. And, and what it does is it very physically moves things from the subconscious to the conscious and can be a great tool, not for everybody, but for some people it can be a very powerful tool. Yeah, Laura, I think you bring up such an important point on how pharmacotherapy um, can help with the just giving you more mental real estate and more presence um, when making food selections, right? Because it helps to quiet down the cravings and the urges so that you can be more mindful. So I think that's a really important point. We do have a live question from, I'm going to pronounce hopefully your name correctly, Sababa. Yes, uh, Sababa. Oh, Thank you so Sababa. much. Thank you so much, Dr. Laura. This was amazing. So correct me if I'm wrong, what I'm understanding is that like any other chronic illness, chronic disease, 
um, initially, um, all the physicians try to let the patient uh, handle the hypertension or prediabetes or anything with lifestyle changes or behavioral changes. But then um, basically the disease is combated with medication. So if I'm not wrong, and that's what my understanding is that uh, obesity, like any other chronic illness, we try to manage that with um, the first pillar, which is lifestyle, the second pillar, which is behavior, but then we need to kind of like bring that third pillar in, which is medication to actually help the patient or make it easy for the patient, right? Is yeah, yeah, well said. And I think I think it's important to recognize that those three pillars are tools that are available for patients, right? So, you know, there are some patients, just like there are some patients with diabetes and hypertension that can manage their chronic disease with, with different modalities and they don't necessarily need medication. Um, there are some patients that probably do need medication to, to manage it realistically. And I think, I, I love that you bring up those, I mean, it is just a chronic disease, it, just a chronic disease. It is a chronic disease like everything else. And we have lifestyle, behavior, psychological, and medication options to help patients. And I think the bias here is that, you know, in every other chronic disease, well, medication is a perfectly great option. Of course, you can use peppers for asthma, and of course, you can use medication to manage blood pressure, but wait, well, that's something, you, you know, you did to yourself, and you should be able to get yourself out of that through lifestyle alone, right? That's the bias. That's the, that's the problem that a lot of people have. If you just ate less, and if you just ate half of what's on your plate, if you just tried a little harder, if you just had a little willpower, and I think what's important to your point is that uh, this is a chronic disease. It's a metabolic condition. It's about chemistry. And yes, there are probably some people who can manage through lifestyle practices, psychological practices, but I think it's always important to recognize that medication is not cheating. It is not giving up, that it is a treatment, and in many cases, a life-changing treatment for patients. Thank, Thank you so you, much, Laura. Thank you. Thank you. Roti, back to you. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, we have a question about the effect of alcohol and sugar on hormones. Yeah, oh wow, okay, that's a big topic. Um, so alcohol, I mean, it depends on the alcohol and, and alcohol effects on, on weight or it's complex and it depends on the person. Um, I think it's, uh, I think what I can say generally is that um, what we know about alcohol sort of as a general kind of umbrella is that in microdosing, I refer to it as microdosing, it's my fancy way of saying in moderation, um, <laughs> is, uh, it is generally Oh, I think Laura's frozen. Is Laura frozen for everybody? Yes. I hope she's not microdosing. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, I'm always, uh, I know she's calling in from Nova Scotia. So, oh no, her screen has gone black. I hope we haven't lost her. Well, um, while we're waiting for Laura to get back on to the screen, I know that we wanted to run that poll again and compare results. So. Pretty, can you can you roll that poll one more time, please? All right. Do you feel that weight is something that can be treated? True or false? All right. Yep. So we have a, a definite increase. 97% of you believe that it is true and only 3% uh, believe that it is false. Um, so we love that. We love to see when we are able to influence opinions um, and bring knowledge. So I think Laura has dropped off and I'm also mindful of time. So We'll see if she comes back, but otherwise I'm just gonna start wrapping up just in case she's not able to get back on time. Um, at the end of every single session, uh, Rachel and I are always delighted to share our biggest takeaway. And I actually have two. Um, the first one is that there is not one single cause of obesity and that there is no single solution. There's not a one size fits all. And that um, obesity really, needs to be treated in a very holistic way, usually looking at every area of one's life. 
Oh. Rachel, I'll let you take over because Coco has an opinion and then I'll come back with my second one. <laughs> okay, well, hopefully I don't steal your second one, Sandra. Um, but I really loved, you know, the concept of looking at, you know, what we consider raging hormones is really, it's just about our chemistry. Um, and our chemistry can be great. But I, I really also loved how uh, Laura broke down the concept that, you know, your chemistry can also dictate sort of how you think. And then because of that, it can drive some of the actions that you take. So I think when I feel like maybe there's these times in life when I'm doing everything the way I'm supposed to be doing and my weight didn't change or it didn't adjust as I would have expected, that I also want to really be mindful of what my chemistry might look like at a given time. And maybe that's the reason why. Yeah, thank you. And the other thing, which I thought was such an important point and helps to alleviate maybe some guilt that some of us feel for weight gain during the pandemic that it isn't so simple to say, oh, we were just home and we baked too much bread. But in fact, that we were going through obviously something very significant global pandemic that obviously would affect our stress and our cortisol levels on a regular basis. And that the stress was likely the biggest contributor to weight gain if you did experience that during the pandemic. So I thought that's really important. So if you're one of those many, many people who did, you know, you can release some of that guilt if you're experiencing that. So I just got a uh, text from Laura, construction outside and my Wi-Fi got cut off from the office. So she's very, very sorry. <laughs> this is a live oh, session. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let her know that it's totally fine and we're gonna wrap up now. So get involved as a member of our Obesity Matters community. We will be sending out a survey and would appreciate you completing it so we can continue to build programs that are recommended by you, our community. Be sure to tune in next for our next session, which is Tuesday, September 23rd at noon Eastern Standard Time. And we will have Dr. David Macklin. So you're really in for a treat. He is uh, an incredible doctor who focuses his practice entirely on obesity management. And he will be answering the question, what is obesity and how is it treated? So with that, uh, we'll thank you all for coming in and we'll end just a few minutes early, but it's always a pleasure and we look forward to seeing you next week. Bye everybody. Bye everyone. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you.